Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the word of Jesus, the word of Christ. Now, God, let us not only hear this word, let your spirit not only help us interpret it, but Father, may we live these words. May these words echo in our hearts, Father, that they may change us and make us more into like you that we may be the image of Jesus here on the earth, that, Father, when people see us, they see Christ. When we walk into a room, it's as if Jesus walked into that, to that room with us. Lord, that we would know that You were here and that Your people worshipped You. And, God, that we will come to an understanding there is much more to life than just living. But it's all about Christ. Move me aside, Jesus. May we hear you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Many of you know that Jesus, He taught in parables. The parable teaching was one of the most easiest forms of teaching during that time because, listen, we all love stories. Amen? If I said the yellow brick, what would you say? Road. We know that story, right? If We love stories. We love stories with a beginning, middle, and an end. If you look in our culture and, and some literature, sometimes stories begin with the middle, then go to the beginning, then to the end, and some stories in, begin with the ending and end with the beginning. That's confusing, isn't it? Jesus, when he would give a parable, he would try to make it as simple as possible. It would have a beginning, middle, and an end. It would always give you some characters that we can identify with. And also, it would end with a great teaching. So if we could put a definition on a parable, a parable is a story or a picture of life that presents deep truth. Amen? That's what a, a parable is. It's a picture or a story of life that presents deep truth. Now, this deep truth will reveal to us many different things. But three categories. One, it will uh, give us an idea of who we are, who God is, who we are to God and others. Because it's much more to life than just our relationship to Jesus. Jesus is concerned and God is concerned with our relationship to everyone around us. So how have you treated people this week? Pretty good? What if we like gave out tickets to people and we was like, hey, can you fill this out and tell me how well I've been this week? How many of you would be comfortable doing that? A few of you raised your hands. You can see me after service. No. I mean, some of us assuredly would probably be okay with that, but we would run in some hitches there. One, we as humans can be entirely and very judgmental. Can I get an amen to that? I don't like the way that preacher's talking to me. I feel like he's judging me. Right? We can be entirely judgmental. And sometimes we'll look at somebody who's judging and we will judge them. Amen? We will judge the judgers because we can do that and because we're really good at it. Jesus said, judge not for who? At least you be judged. Can we say that we're all equal before God and God looks at us and He loves us and He's happy with us at times and He is saddened by us at times? Can we say that? Oh yes, yes we can. Jesus taught in parables because it revealed how we respond to each other and how we respond to God. And then sometimes we don't always respond in the right way. And that's why these parables teach us about people who don't respond exactly in the right way. I mean, Jesus, he was asked, Lord, what is the greatest command? And Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, might, and strength. Amen? Or mind, not might, might. So if we would love Jesus with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, amen, what would this world look like? Oh, man. Maybe it would look like some of those uh, operations y'all did this week. When they'd go into a community, they'd bring food, music, and games for the children, and they'd present Jesus. Wouldn't it be cool if our world was just one big block party of Jesus? Would that not be amazing and beautiful? But Jesus, he left his people here for a reason. Have you ever wondered, why don't we just get zapped to heaven after we get baptized or after we receive the Holy Spirit in our heart? Wouldn't that be amazing? It's like, hey, I've received the Lord. Zap, you're gone. Right? You're like, no, Chris, I don't know if I like that. But there's a principle to it. Why are we still here? 
He asks some kids, well, why did you receive Jesus? So I can die and go to heaven. Yes, any, any kid, most of them will say, so I can die and go to heaven. And they say it smiling, so I can die and go to heaven. There is much, much more to being a Christian than just dying and going to heaven. There's like this big section before that ever happens. And that is what we call being a disciple and a follower of Jesus. Salvation happens in an instant. A following of Jesus is a lifetime event. And it's a journey. Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the journey, the truth, and the life. Amen. Amen. Are you on this journey? Have you started it? Are you in the middle of it? Are you going through a hard time? Because listen, Jesus is with you, and he'll go with it through you, or with you through it. Now, Jesus, he gave another parable after he said this, love the Lord your God with all your strength, right? Mind, strength, soul, spirit, everything inside of you. Just love the Lord your God. And then he added something to it. What was it? Love your neighbor as what? Yourself. Amen? Most will say, I, I love God, but I don't like my neighbor. You know, Jesus didn't like the Pharisees, but he died for them. Jesus didn't like what they did, but he loved them. Amen? After this, Jesus was asked, well, Lord, who is my neighbor then? And Jesus, what parable did he say? The parable, parable of the good Samaritan. And we all know this one, right? Someone was beaten and left naked in a ditch, and then a priest comes walking by. He, he goes on the other side of the guy, laying there, needing help so that he wouldn't become ritual, ritually unclean and then able to go to the temple for a few days. So this guy, he's dead or maybe almost dying. He's like, oh, well, can't help him. I'm just going to go around. You ever pass anybody in need? Right? So a priest goes by, he walks on by, then a Levite. The Levite, he kind of checks it out, but he's like, I ain't getting involved. However, you kind of checked it out, but you're like, oh, that's too much trouble for me. Amen. Aren't you glad that God is not like that? Amen. What if God said, you know what, I don't have time for that today? Yes. Amen? God never rejects his children. Yes. God never says, I'm too tired to listen to you. God never says, I can't afford that. Yes. Amen? God never says those things. Now, if you were a Jewish person during that time hearing this parable, you hear a priest come by, then a Levite come by, and obviously everybody knows in that culture that Jesus, oh, we're seeing where you're going, a Levite, uh, excuse me, an Israelite's going to come by who would be considered just a, a normal common person. But no, Jesus didn't go there. Jesus blew their minds. Jesus said a Samaritan. And if you understand that culture, the Jews did not like the Samaritans, and the Samaritans did not like the Jews. There was a big controversy there. They couldn't stand each other. Matter of fact, there was, uh, Samaria was in between Israel and Judea, and some Jews would go all the way around Samaria just so they wouldn't have to pass through the Samaritans. That's how much their dislike was. And so as Jesus said, a priest come by, a Levite, and then a Samaritan, I guarantee you everybody went, <gasps> Because at that moment, the point was driven home. Everybody knew what was going to happen. Because it was a parable. Parables are taught in threes. They give you two examples of what not to do or what to do. And then you, they give you the, the, third, the third one that shows you the truth in the matter. Amen. So this Samaritan comes by, bandages him up, pays for his room, and says, listen, if there's anything else, tell me and I'll pay for it. Jesus said, who was his neighbor? Parables are beautiful. Parable, parables reveal the reflection of a, of a heart. Parables reveal sometimes the deceptive ways of our hearts. I'm so glad Jesus didn't turn a blind eye to us. Amen. Amen. But here we have in this parable here of the talents now, this master, he's going on a journey. He leaves a good size of money to these people. Now, to one he leaves ten, to one he leaves five, and to one he leaves one. Now, we're not sure what a talent is. We just know it's a measurement of money here. Some people say a year's wages. But listen, if someone gave you ten years' wages, 
He's like, hey, I'm going to go far off. I'm not sure when I'm going to come back. How many of you are like, oh, 10 years wages? I'm going to be in another country, buddy. Right? But these people did not do that, did they? They stayed. Matter of fact, the guy with 10, he went out, invested it. He made how much more? 10 more. We're going to go to math school now. The five made how much more? Five. They doubled it. I love the third one. He is so precious. He takes his talent and he goes and he does what? He buries it. Have you ever seen anybody get like a toy or something and they go bury it in the yard? Husbands, if your wives ever give you anything, you do not do that. You don't just go and bury it in the yard like that. This guy was given money. He does nothing when he goes out. He buries it in the yard, people. I wonder if he drew a little map to it, just in case, right? Just in case. Finally, that master returns. Now, these three men probably had three different feelings towards the master. Maybe the first two were similar. But the first two were driven by this need to please the master, to please their Lord. And so they did everything they possibly could to take care of the money in which they were given. And they doubled their profit. So the master says to them, well done, what? Good and faithful servant. Amen. You've been faithful in little, so I'm going to give you a lot. Amen. Now church, most of the time we're really good at making big decisions. Most of us, we are, we're good at making big decisions. But you know what? It's the little ones that really count. All those little decisions you make every day add up over time. And these little decisions that we make can really impact our relationship with Jesus and our relationship to everybody else. Can you believe that one little sin could make a whole people's lives really difficult? Have you ever heard of this place called uh, the Garden of Eden? Yeah, really difficult. Is God that invested in our lives that he wants the best for us? Amen? And he doesn't want to just bless us a little bit. God wants to bless us a lot. But he also wants us to be faithful in the little things of life. So he could bless us with the big things. Here's the third servant. I love him, guys. He's so precious. He presents himself to the Lord. How many of you would have, have a really good excuse why you didn't do good better than the first two guys? Because if all three of us got back together and I didn't know how those guys did, I was like, well, man, I buried mine. Mine's safe. I got mine. I bet they lost theirs. And the first guy's like, yeah, I made 10 more. I wonder if this man's heart just sunk, you know? It's like, oh, man, I'm in so much trouble. And then he's hoping that this second guy maybe did even worse than him. And he's like, oh, this guy even made more than, than, than me, too. But guess what? They did something with it. What did he do? Nothing. He didn't do anything. So he has this speech. He said, Lord, you, you gave me one talent, right? You gave me one talent. So I went, I buried it. Here's what is yours. I could ch picture him just saying, here, take it. It's yours. But the Lord, he said something very hurtful. He said, you... Wicked and lazy servant. Y'all want to say that together? You wicked and lazy servant. How many of you have said that to your kids? Anybody? <laughs> or said that to your kids, right? You wicked and lazy servant. Right? Go ahead and do it. It feels good. No. <laughs> right? This master is speaking from the heart here. He's very displeased with his servant because he gave his servant one job. Here is my talent. Use it. Take care of it. At least get me some interest here. This guy goes and buries it. Now, I've heard many pastors, many sermons, many different uh, devotions about what a talent is compared to today. And I just want to defer to that first greatest commandment. That you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. When you do this, you will glorify God. The talent in which God has given each of us is the responsibility of glorifying Him. 
And each of us have been blessed in certain and very various different ways of how to glorify God. Because listen, we serve one spirit, but that spirit is multifaceted in where we all have certain gifts and we all have certain abilities to impact our world and to impact the world around us. And so listen, if you're not using your God-given ability to glorify God, then you have went and buried your talent in the dirt. And you're waiting on Jesus to come back. And listen, He will come back. That is His promise to us, and He is a faithful God. But there are some of us, we need to go and dig that talent out and glorify Him. And give Him glory, because doesn't he, don't He deserve it? God deserves the glory. We bury it. A uh, seminary professor up in Boston, he had this thing that what he would do every year for the freshmen is he would dress completely like a crazy man. He'd make his hair all messed up. He'd put uh, dirt in his face and he'd wear smelly clothes and he wouldn't, he'd just wear one shoe with one sock on the other foot and he would just sit out near the seminary. And many of these college kids, are, they're coming for ministry to learn evangelism and they're walking right past this guy just laying on the bench. And he's paying close attention because he wants to make sure that he remembers who walked by because they may have his evangelism class. Oh, it's the first day of class rolls by. He sits out there. Man, hundreds of people goes by him. He said only one person stopped by. But it was just to say, hey, buddy, why are you here? Whoops. <laughs> this is in front of a, like a seminary. He goes into his class dressed as is. So some of the students are like, who is this bum coming in here? And he gets behind the, the podium and he's like, listen, I'm your teacher. And some people laugh. They thought he's joking. He's like, no, man, I'm your teacher. And I remember a lot of you walked me right by. Isn't it crazy to know that there may be people who will not make it because there are some Christians who didn't want to get involved. Or God forbid that we were just lazy. That we were just lazy. We just didn't feel like it. You know what laziness is? Have you ever heard of this show, Dora the Explorer? Polysemos. We did it. Right? Anyone with a child would know this cartoon. And anyone with a child would know, as soon as that kid's out of the room, we're going to change that channel as quickly as possible. <laughs> or turn off the TV, or sometimes take the TV and throw it in the wilderness. <laughs> right? So there's nothing good on that thing most of the time. But this is laziness. This is laziness. After we got the kids to bed, I laid on the couch, and there was Dora. We did it. We did it. <laughs> and the remote was at the other end of the couch. I was like, man, I just don't feel like getting that remote, man. That's laziness. Just a great descri description of it. I could have reached over and turned that off, but I was sitting there and just watching her dance. But I was too lazy to grab it. Laziness is the desire to do nothing. And listen, there's, laziness has its advantages at times when you're on vacation, Amen. Right? Or when you've lived a long time and worked really hard and you can spare to be lazy here and there. But the Bible teaches us that laziness in another form is very dangerous. It says in Proverbs 10, 4, it says, A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. It says in Proverbs 10, 26, Like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes are the lazy to their employers. How many of y'all like had anybody at work with you or maybe you've uh, like supervised somebody who was just plumb lazy, right? Bosses don't like that. Uh, Proverbs 15, 19, listen to this. The way of the lazy is overgrown with thorns, but the path of the upright is level highway. It says in Proverbs 19, 24, it says this, the lazy person buries his hand in the dish and will not even bring it back up to the mouth. Now that's lazy, guys. I mean, you're hungry, but you just don't feel like putting the effort to eat. Listen, that will never happen to me. <laughs> I will make that effort. I will make it happen. Uh, Proverbs 22.13 says this. The lazy person says, there's a lion outside. 
I shall be killed in the streets. This is my favorite parable of them all. Because there, can you believe that there are people who are so lazy that they will make up an, an extreme excuse to get out of work? This guy says, well, if I go to work, I could get eaten by a lion. You know? That's a bad excuse, people. Can, do people make up excuses so they won't work? Proverbs 26, 14 says this. This is a great one. As a door turns on its hinges, so does a lazy person in his bed. <laughs> Doors open a lot, people, right? Those hinges work a lot. Uh, Paul said this in 1 Thessalonians, uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, uh, verse 10. Those who do not work shall not what? Eat. Can you believe back then there were people living off the church and not putting forth any effort in the evangelism of, the, of others. They were just showing up to eat. Uh, it says in 1 Corinthians 11, 20-22, when Paul was talking about the Lord's Supper, he says, some of you, when you get together to experience the Lord's Supper, some of you push others out of the way so you can eat, and then some of you even go and get drunk at church. So Paul said, I have a pastor friend, he pastors a small church, and he had a family just come up to him. He's like, listen, we're, sorry, we're going to leave the church. He's like, well, Why? He goes, well, you don't have enough socials. They take their pot roast serious. <laughs> right? Can you believe that we live in a culture that would base their worship around their bellies? Amen. Matter of fact, Paul said something that you've made your God your belly. Amen. Right? Laziness will kill you. Laziness towards the gospel, and I would almost call it an apathy. I think our country has fallen into an apathetic way towards evangelism and towards the gospel. We're just so apathetic about it. And we'll say things like, oh, that person, he'll just never change. If you really believe that, then you're in the wrong place. Who can God change? right? You know you, and you know who you are, and God loves you. Amen? And God is working and changing you. How could we ever think that God could not change an individual? God and the power of the Holy Spirit, and listen, by the hands and the hearts of His people, He can get the gospel out. Church, this is why we are here. This is why. And this servant missed out because he was wicked and he was lazy. He wanted to do what he wanted to do and he did not want to put forth any effort. In your bulletin, there's an insert. It says, witnessing is worship. Did y'all see that? How many of y'all looked at it and they're like, oh no, the pastor, what is he doing today? Right? Right? But there's three scriptures on there. The first, out of Isaiah, it says that we are the glory of God. Can y'all say that with me? I am the glory of God. Go for it. I am the glory of God. Yes, you are. Even when your hair looks like a mess in the morning, you are still the glory of God. Even when you don't brush your teeth, listen, you are still the glory of God. Just people won't get near you. But you're the glory of God. God created you for His glorious works. Amen? Jesus was coming into Jerusalem. And the Pharisees said, Jesus, tell your people to stop praising you. And Jesus said, if they were silent, the what? The rocks would scream out to me. Amen. Listen, let's not, rocks, let's not let rocks get the glory. Amen? Should we be loud about Jesus? Yes. Oh, yes, we should. We should be happy about it. I was in Walmart one time making a purchase, and the lady said, what is wrong with you? I was like, what? She goes, you're just so happy. It's like, oh, that's a good problem, right? She's happy. She was treating it like it was a problem. I said, well, ma'am, I love the Lord. And she goes, oh, I see now, you know? But yes, she should see. Amen? She should see. Don't bury your talent. Don't bury it. Don't be lazy. Don't let someone slip away because you didn't want to put forth effort. Jesus said in Matthew 28 
that we are to go and make what? Disciples. Now, disciples are not fans of Jesus. It's just not people who like Jesus or like Christianity. Disciples are people who have a desire in their heart to see more disciples made. And, more, and those disciples make more disciples. And we just see the fruit of God expand everywhere. And the love just catch on fire. And it would be amazing to be a disciple of the Lord in this way. But this will never take place if we don't be intentional about how we present Jesus. Do you all know people? You know people in your life? I'm a messenger of Jesus and a representative of His very glory. Amen. I will pray and attempt to show love and witness to... And I left some blanks here. But listen, if you want to turn it on the back and just fill up this back here. But you know people in your life who need Jesus and need the love of Christ. I want you to pray over this. And you write their names in here. And ask God to give you boldness and courage and diligence in reaching them. Amen? Amen. Now, don't y'all put your grocery list on this. Don't put eggs, milk, and honey. Right? Don't put Mickey, Goofy, and Donald here. Put real people who really need Jesus. Do you know why? Because God is real. Christ lived a sinless life. He died and was raised again so that none of us would what? Perish. But have what? Everlasting life. Okay, this is key because hell is real. Hell is as real as heaven. I'll end with a parable. Jesus said there was a rich man and a poor man. Amen. Amen. The rich man sat in his house of elegance and he ate finely every night. His house was in purples and probably pretty colors. And outside his gates of his house was a beggar named who? Lazarus. It's the only parable that Jesus has ever mentioned someone's name. And he said Lazarus would sit out there starving and even a dog would come by and lick his sores. That was how destitute he was. When Jesus said both these men die. The rich man receives his reward and he goes to Hades. The poor man receives his reward and he's ushered to the bosom of Abraham. And it said there was a great divide between hell and heaven. But this man in hell, this rich man, in all his splendor of living, he looks up and he sees the beggar that was outside of his door whose only friend was a dog. And he realizes, man, it's it's so miserable here. Listen, Abraham, Father Abraham, if you could just get Lazarus to put a drop of water on my tongue to cool. But Abraham said, the void is vast and you can't get through it. And he said, well, Father Abraham, if you can't do that, but at least would you send somebody to my five brothers to tell them of this torment so they would turn their lives You know, Abraham said to him, this has been the harshest thing to hear. He says, they have Moses and the prophets. And he said, "If even if somebody who died and came back to life came and told them, they would not believe. We have Jesus. And we're his hands. We're his feet. We're his heart. Don't bury that talent you have. Because don't we all want to hear Jesus say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Amen. Would you please stand as we go to Lord in prayer. Father, you are so good. We do not deserve your blessings. We do not deserve your grace. We do not deserve your mercy. But Father, you are so good in your forever love that you've given us things we do not deserve. And you withhold punishment that we so deserve. Father, I pray as we open up the altar today, as we go into a time of invitation, Lord, that we would just be real with you. 
And Lord, if there are some of us here, we've, we've really buried our talent. We've really not been serving. We, we haven't been giving to you. We haven't been loving our neighbors as we should. Father, that your Holy Spirit would convict us in such a way, Lord, that we would repent. And Father, that a, a fire would be blazing in our hearts. That people around us would feel the very presence of Jesus. We pray this in faith and hope and love in Christ. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.